at the American University in Cairo. Uh, I'm Mark Eats, an assistant professor in the history department. I'm also the director of uh, CASAR. Uh, it's my pleasure to work there uh, as well with uh, my assistant, uh, Yasmin, over here by the, uh, the refreshments table, uh, who's also an adjunct professor. It's also um, my privilege to welcome uh, Stephen Salata today. Stephen Salata is a professor of English and Comparative Literature at AUC, and he is the author of eight books. A lot of us academics are lucky to get one. <laughs> Stephen's got eight. Okay. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Oklahoma, and he is currently finishing a memoir about leaving and returning to academia. His latest book, An Honest Living, will be published by Fordham University Press. And you can also read his writing uh, on his blog called uh, No Flags, No Slogans. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Stephen Slate. Hi, everyone. Is, is my voice projecting OK? Please let me know if it, it starts to flag. <clears throat> okay. So, I know we have limited time, and that uh, many of us have a, a 2 p.m. class, uh, including myself. So, I, I I don't want to overburden you with, with, with my presence, any, anyone I need to. So I, I, I want to start uh, by thanking Professor Dietz and, and Kassar for putting this together and for inviting me. It's, it's a great honor to be here. And I want to thank uh, Yasmin also for all of her, her work on this. And, and, and thank you all for coming and spending the hour with me. Uh, I'll try to make it as useful for you as, as possible. Um, so this talk is, is derived from a, an article that I had been working on and that I finished um, recently for a, a special issue of, of Middle East Critique, and they wanted me to write about Palestine and free speech. And so I extracted from that article and, and got it down to a, a sort of a manageable size. And then I started thinking that maybe it would be a little boring for people if I just read from a paper, that maybe I should just um, speak off the cuff. Um, and I wasn't sure what to do, so I printed the paper, and it's here, and then I, I just decided that I'm going to speak. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason for that is I hope that it will uh, allow us a little bit of um, connection, but also there, there are a good amount of students here, and I, I want to make sure that I have an opportunity to provide some of the context to some of the issues that are, are happening in the West, in the United States particularly, and so that everybody can feel like they're caught up and, and understand what, you know, what it is I'm saying or, or, or the basis of my critique and so I want everybody to be able to have the, the, the context. So bear with me. I'll try not to ramble for too long. I'll try also to leave some time at the end for questions or comments if you have any. And with apologies, I'm going to have to run out of here at the end so, so I can make it to my class. But you're, you're always welcome, of course, to, you know, to be in touch with me and at my AUC email address, and, and I'm happy to speak with you about um, any of these, these issues if you want to discuss them further. So the first bit of, of context is me, and so I want to tell you a little bit about my relationship to this topic of free speech in Palestine for those um, who aren't familiar with, with, with that story. Um, I come to AUC, or I came last year having experienced some difficulties in academia around this question of free speech in Palestine. And by now it's an, an old story, thankfully, but in 2014, 
I was uh, fired from a tenured position at the University of Illinois for very, what you could say, uh, strongly worded, that's how I would describe them, uh, other people describe them differently, strongly worded tweets about Israel's 2014 um, assault on Gaza Strip, and that firing ended up uh, becoming sort of a major news story in, in the academic industry and beyond for that year. Um, I ended up taking a job in Lebanon uh, at AUB. I was uh, essentially let go from, from that job as well. And then uh, for five years, I was, um, I was out of teaching. I was out of the academic world altogether. I started driving the school bus and, uh, because I couldn't get an academic job. And then I saw an ad uh, for uh, a position in ECLT at, at AUC, and uh, I thought about it for a long time, and I said, I, I think I want to apply for this. I want to go back to the Arab world. I want to go back to the classroom. I miss the classroom. Um, you know, Egypt is, 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 you know, it's not world renowned for, for its tradition of, of free speech, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a place at least where, you know, there, there's some level of comfort, uh, you know, the opposing Zionism. And, 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 and criticizing the Zionist entity, and so, and I also knew some of the people in, in the department and had a great amount of respect for them, and so, long story short, I got the job, here I am. And so I'm, I'm back in academe, but I've been thinking about this issue of free speech a lot, you know, over the past 10 years, even before then, because anybody who is involved in any sort of what might be called pro-Palestine activism in, in the West, in the United States particularly, has to think about the issue of free speech because really discussion of Palestine or more specifically opposition to Zionism is largely verboten or, or forbidden in the West, in the United States. It's, it's something that gets a lot of people in trouble. Um, I, I'm one of them, but I'm far from the only one, and I'm going to go into that here in just a second. So that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I, I have experience around free speech in Palestine in my professional life, and then experience in the US court system, and uh, experience with, with the issue of academic freedom in the court system as well. Let me start by explaining the title. Um, it, the title is The Free Speech Exception to Palestine, and that's actually an inversion of a common phrase that has existed in, in, in North America over the past 12 or 13 years or so. And the way that the phrase normally reads is the Palestine exception to free speech. That term, or that phrase, was coined by uh, a, a now deceased uh, civil rights attorney named Michael Ratner. Um, he was a great man. And uh, he, he helped in my uh, legal defense uh, you know, uh, back in 2014, and he helped me a lot uh, personally as well. He was the one, or one of the founders of the group that you might have heard of now called Palestine Legal. And Palestine Legal in the United States and in Canada as well helps people who are facing some sort of Zionist repression. And so Ratner came up with, with the phrase, uh, you know, the, the free speech exception to Palestine to sort of point to how free speech protections don't apply to pro-Palestine or to anti-Zionist sentiment. And so he was pointing to a particular hypocrisy around the issue of free speech. So I thought I would invert that phrase, and, and it, because I would think about it from the point of view, well, maybe there's not simply a Palestine exception to an iron, ironclad or consistently practiced civil liberty in free speech, Maybe there's a defect in the notion and practice of free speech that allows it so easily to exclude Palestine. But if you look into the history of free speech and civil liberties more broadly in the United States, you'll find that they've never been universally applied. Somebody has always been excluded from them, systemically excluded from them. Palestine is only one of a, a long list of ideological and ethnic and cultural and religious communities that haven't had full access to, to civil liberties. So when I say the free speech exception to Palestine, I think that it's easy for free speech to dispose of Palestine based on inherent flaws in the way free speech is understood and practiced in the United States. We can see 
some of those limitations and flaws right now, again, around the issue of Palestine. And it's not just in the United States. Uh, it exists to different degrees, of course, in the Arab world, where there is uh, a state-sponsored repression of what might be called anti-Zionist or pro-Palestine sentiment. Um, it exists in Egypt, it exists in Jordan, it exists in, in the UAE, but, and so forth. But it also <coughs> exists throughout the West. Uh, Germany is, is on an anti-free speech rampage that, that is, is, is almost uh, incomprehensible at the moment. So is Canada, so is the UK, so is the United States. And what I mean by that is that not only are people being dissuaded from speaking, they're actively being criminalized for speaking. In the United States, student groups, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, for example, is, is, is being systemically repressed on various campuses. Uh, its members are being harassed. Uh, some IDF soldiers at Columbia University last week just sprayed skunk spray you know, on, on some pro-Palestine demonstrators on campus, and, and the, the, the university was by and large silent about it. Uh, the president of Columbia University, this doesn't have to do with anything, but I thought the trivia, you know, would be of interest to you. The president of Columbia University is from Egypt, all right? So, uh, you know, she's, 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 she's doing the, the, the work of, of the ruling class like any good Ivy League president is, 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 is going to be obliged to do. Because two of her colleagues in the Ivy League right, got, um, got fired, basically. All right? They got removed from their jobs at the University of Pennsylvania and then, uh, more notably, Harvard University, the club being gay. And they got removed from their position. Now, remember, these are presidents of, of Ivy League universities. These are, these are serious positions. Not because they were taking up for Palestinians, but because they were expressing inadequate fealty to Zionism. They, they refused essentially to say that the slogan from the river to the sea is categorically anti-Semitic. And for that, they were dragged in front of Congress, and uh, ultimately they were removed from their positions. But and I, I'm not going to spend too much of my time worrying about the fate of Ivy League University presidents. I'm more concerned with the students who are being skunk sprayed, the students who are being arrested, the students who are being kicked out of school and otherwise punished. Same thing is happening to faculty and staff on campuses throughout the West. It's for the paper. I ended up sort of producing a, 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 a list of, of these acts of repression and criminalization, and it's really almost beyond comprehension um, the, the the amount of examples that we have, and it extends beyond matters of of speech, right? Um, I don't know if you all saw the video, it's uh, about two months old now, in New York City, uh, of a pro-Israel woman uh, striking at, at a child and hitting them, a Palestinian child, and that has been caught on video numerous times. Even worse, Palestinians have been uh, shot and murdered in, in the United States over the past three months. Uh, three students at uh, the University of Vermont, for example, three Palestinian students. Were, were shot. One of them is, is, is permanently paralyzed from the neck down. Um, a six-year-old Palestinian child was murdered by a, a white Islamophobe in a suburb of, of Chicago. There was another murder just last week of, 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 of another Palestinian child. And so these, these acts of repression go beyond speech, even though you can say they originated in, in speech acts. They, they move on into acts of, of physical violence as, as well. So the, the current state of repression is out of control to the point where it's become common wisdom. Now, when I was growing up, and my parents are immigrants from this region, I was always told to be careful around the issue of Palestine. Okay, and this is in the dark ages now. You know, I'm, I'm pretty old, all right? Uh, and I think a lot of, of Arab and Muslim Americans of my generation, maybe before, maybe after, were told something similar, that this is going to cause you a whole heap of trouble. So we've always known that discussing Palestine favorably or criticizing Israel was a, you know, was a dubious or a dicey proposition in, in, in the United States. That's really in a lot of ways a fundamental part of the, 
the Arab American identity is, is an inherent understanding that we have to treat politics very carefully, all right? And that our parents, or many of our parents anyway, are circumspect, are a little bit worried about us getting involved in anything political. Now, my parents, uh, when I did start speaking up, ultimately supported me, and in that way, I, I feel extremely lucky, right? They, they, you know, they, they believed in my voice, and they believed in the justice of the Palestinian cause, and so that was enough to overcome, you know, whatever hesitation or, or nervousness they <laughs> they might have felt. But any Palestinian or Arab or Muslim graduate student, let's say, right, who, who, who wants to study this region and who goes into a program thinking to study Palestine at, at all is warned. I mean, this is a basic part of the educational process in the United States. Don't get too political about this. Keep it to scholarly issues, right? Don't ever discuss X, Y, and Z. Don't ever offend X, Y, and Z. And so the repression is built into the very culture of discussion around Palestine and the region more broadly. What I'm saying is that nobody who takes aim at a career having anything to do with Palestine goes into it thinking that they are free to say what they want or to express their politics in a way that is true to their actual beliefs. Does that make sense? People just, just don't do it, all right? Or when they do do it, they understand that it might have a, a significant cost to their professional or to their personal lives. So when I was, uh, when I found the AUC job a few years ago, the, the one that I now occupy, um, I was looking at, at international jobs. So I knew I was never going to get a job in the United States ever again. That, that, was, that was out of the question. It's always going to be out of the question. It's, it's really the outer world and the global south are nothing. For me, and I'm fine with that because I don't want to go back to the United States. Uh, if they kick me out of here, I could go back to the United States. Uh, and then this is part of the reason why, all right? Because it's it's de descending into a very specific kind of, and I use this word on purpose. Some of you might want to argue with me. It's descending into a specific kind of fascism, and nowhere is it more notable than the way the issue of Palestine is discussed or not discussed, and the cultures of discourse around Palestine in general. But uh, I was looking for something on the international job market that had to do with, you know, with Palestine, with Arabs. I saw a bunch of job ads that have to do with Israel studies, all right, Israel studies this, or Jewish studies with a focus on Israel, you know, so, so. Nowhere on the international job market did I ever see the word Palestine, or the word Palestinian. It quite simply didn't exist, all right? So Palestinians are, by and large, absent from Anglophone academia. We exist. As students, we exist sometimes as, as scholars, but we generally do not exist as subjects worthy of serious study because they consider us as, as, as inhabiting a particular danger right, to the normative structures of power on campus, and they don't want to have anything to do with that because you cannot do Palestine studies in a serious way or in a meaningful way or in a true way without also doing anti-Zionism. All right, the, the, the two are, are interrelated, and you can't just separate one from the other. I would submit that the current remission that we're seeing throughout the West and in parts of, of the East is not simply a byproduct of the current genocide, I would argue that it is part and parcel of the, the current genocide. One thing that any genocide relies on is successful control over the flow of information. Right? Uh, genocide relies on some level of repression some ability to manage public perception, some ability to manage the types of words that are being used. And you can sort of trace right, the, this aspect of the genocide to the kinds of, what's the right word, to the kind of hysterical opposition that has been cycling through the discourse around the type of language that advocates of Palestinian liberation use. 
It started with from the river to the sea, right? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a genocidal slogan. They kept saying and kept saying and kept saying, and then now it it, it moves on into every aspect of the public conversation. And so the point is to render any articulation of pro-Palestine sympathies or pro-Palestine sentiment into something that is inherently harmful, not only to Israelis, but to Jews more broadly, not only to Israelis and to Jews more broadly, all right, but to the traditions of democratic modernity itself. Palestine has effectively been positioned in, in Western public opinion and Western public discourse as something primitive, as something that rose against the democratic values that a country like Israel embodies. This has to do with free speech. Um, because I've been thinking a lot about it over the years and about the way that people in English, largely in the United States, the way that they discuss free speech as an issue. And they tend not to discuss it as a civil liberty. If you have to pay attention to free speech discourses, right, and, and the way that people talk about free speech in, in, in the West and the United States, you'll see it if you haven't seen it already. They discuss free speech not as a right, but as a civilizational imperative. And I, I want to explain what I mean by that. It, it feeds into what I was saying just a few moments ago about Palestine sort of being, uh, being made to associate with a kind of cultural primitiveness, all right, that, that, that threatens to envelop and, and take down the entire West culturally, ethically, morally, intellectually. There are lots of ways that we <clears throat> you call mainstream discourse in the U.S. likes to distinguish itself from the Arab world or the Muslim world more broadly. You could even say the Global South more broadly. One of them is technological superiority. Right? One of them is, is religion. One of them is... Um, the clothing that people wear. They'd say the main one, though, is free speech. Right? Free speech is what separates a good, modern, democratic country from all of, of the hordes existing in, in the third world, who not only have no right to free speech, but who don't understand free speech. They don't know what it means. They don't know how to practice it. Right? It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute. With them. It's not part of, of their mentality. So very often when you hear right-wing civil libertarians in, in the United States uh, praising and reifying free speech, they're often also at the same time, if only tacitly, right, suggesting that their adherence to free speech is what separates them from people of, of a lesser culture around the world. That's what separates them from Muslims, for example. They don't believe in free speech. They don't know how to practice free speech. Not only that, free speech doesn't make sense to them. These are communities and societies that are given to hierarchy. Right? They're given to obedience. Right? They're set up and structured to do as they are told. They don't know how to practice and perform freedom. So built in to this binary, into this way of thinking, right, is an automatic rationale or pretext for visiting imperialist aggression right, on parts of the world which the United States and its allies want to extract resources. It's all tied together. I'm going to give you some examples um, that, that, that I hope are, are useful. And a, a, again, uh, forgive me for, for, for rambling. Um, For those who don't follow debates around free speech in, in the U.S. closely, I'll try to give you a, a little bit of, of background. And for those of you who, who do, forgive me if I'm getting you wrong or and or boring you. There has been a raging cultural war, you know, for the past four or five or, or six years, however many, in, in the U.S. 
around uh, the, the issue of, of free speech that has absolutely dominated the sort of the uh, the sort of the, the bourgeois magazine classes and, and, and social media, et, et, et cetera. And it's really hinged around this notion of cancel culture. All right? uh, and and I, I don't know in what ways cancel culture is, is discussed and debated in Egypt. I just know that in my experience, my students have tended really not to give much of a shit about it. Right? Uh, it's just something that, that tends not to register with them too much, all right? uh, even when they're familiar with it. But, um, I mean, I, I could be wrong, that's just, just my anecdotal experience. In the United States and, and in other Western societies, it's, it's a big deal. And the thinking goes that there's a, a class of illiberal people who want to shut down speech, and in wanting to shut down speech, also want to shut down everything that, that, that makes the United States great. Everything that we value and cherish and hold sacred, you know, they, they want to run roughshod over. I was always skeptical of the, the whole cancel culture discourse, and, and I, in that sense I was an outlier. And the reason I was skeptical of it was not because I'm illiberal or don't believe in free speech. I very much, I'm not a liberal, right? But I very much uh, believe in, in free speech, right? I, I, I think it's important. I think it's something worth preserving. And much more I'm talking about really is, is, is not free speech itself as a legal protection or as a civil liberty, but it's discourses around free speech. Right? And, and how free speech sort of fits into, you know, uh, you know how it fits into ideological patterns in, in, in the United States. But the, the reason, if, if I can be as frank as possible, that I was skeptical of the cancel culture narrative is because I noticed immediately that the people peddling it were all Zionists. Right? That's always going to raise a red flag with me. Always, right? Uh, Barry Weiss, who, who worked at the New York Times, right? Uh, just, just a horrible, horrible human being. You might know her as the person who started a dog pile on our beloved martyr, Rifat, on Twitter a few weeks before he was murdered, you know, by the Zionists, right? Uh, and he tweeted before he died, if something happens to me, I hold Barry Weiss personally responsible. Barry Weiss came out of uh, Columbia, University. I don't know if you've heard, uh, Columbia's home to Rashid Khalidi, other big name scholars. Um, it's also home to Joseph Massad, another Palestinian scholar. And she helped lead a vicious campaign against his tenure bid in, in the early to mid 2000s, all right? A campaign that lasted years and then in lots of ways it's still going. We get to Nadia Abdul Hajj, also, all right? And another professor at Columbia Barnard, another Palestinian professor. Well, 10 years later, Barry Weiss emerges as the face of free speech and civil liberties, all right? As do a bunch of, 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 of other partisan pro-Israel activists. And if they want to be pro-Israel and pro-free speech, I can't do anything about it. But when they're pro-Israel, pro-free speech, and also have a history of getting Palestinians fired and criminalized for their speech, then I do. Then I take notice. Then there's a problem. So I start thinking, okay, all of the people who are really pushing this particular narrative of free speech, they're all horrible human beings, first of all, okay? They're all very pro-Israel, right? They all, or some of them, not they all, some of them have a history right, of agitating against pro-Palestine speech and trying to shut it down. What's the disconnect here? What's the problem? I know that there's a problem. And it's a problem that, that nobody seems to be picking up on, or very few people seem to be picking up on. So I want to figure this out and, and, and put language to it and, and put, you know, put some reason or rationale to it. And I quickly concluded that the entire cancel culture industry, all right, and this is quite beyond whether I believe in cancellation or not, right? I'm saying the cancel culture industry. I would say it was a Zionist effort from the outset. Not only because of the composition of its main characters and its main players, but also because all of the people who have gotten famous and who have gotten enormous platforms talking about the importance of free speech and being against cancel culture, not a single one of them has ever mentioned Palestine. Not a single one of them has ever mentioned the Palestinian who's gotten fired. How many times over the past five years have I been tagged on Twitter? Well, what about Stephen Salaita? Do you know what I mean? How, what about Stephen? Not silence. They won't say anything. All of them, right? 
The only one who ever says anything about Palestine is Glenn Greenwald. All right, uh, but the rest of them, it's complete silence. All right, and that silence is not an accident. The reason being, it's a narrative from the outset that was meant not to preserve everybody's civil liberties. It was meant to preserve a particularly traditionalist view of the United States that is inherently imperialist and that is inherently conservative and that is inherently traditionalist. All right? That's the point of that effort. So sometimes people will say, you know, Steve got canceled. You should talk about Steve. And I shut it down. I don't like it. I don't like being referred to as somebody who got canceled because I don't want to contribute to that cancel culture nonsense, first of all, right? Uh, for reasons I just explained. But second of all, because I don't think that I got canceled. What happened to me and so many other people was that my career was effectively destroyed based on imperialist commonplaces that dominate common sense in Western academia. It's something that goes beyond cancel culture. It's something that can't be explained through illiberalism, right, or through simplistic civil libertarian terms. It's something that is structurally deeper. It's something that, that kind of speaks to the way that knowledge is produced, the way that knowledge is disseminated, the way that knowledge is fundamentally limited, right, and the ways that a moment of politics always managed to win out in the end Right? through the limits of the discourse that people within the industry will consider acceptable or worthwhile or rational or anything else. Am I making sense? Am I making sense? You can, you can please tell me. But, um, what we're seeing now is an intensification of repression that, in my opinion, hasn't been seen in the United States since uh, the McCarthy era of the 1950s and the early 1960s. This is when the, the government persecuted anybody and everybody with, who had communist sympathies or who supposedly had communist sympathies. And it was, it was famous, uh, the, the McCarthy era, for burning through Hollywood, burning through academe, other uh, white collar industries, and then getting a lot of people uh, fired and, and, and blacklisted from, from their chosen professions on and on. I, I don't want to compare it to, I don't want to compare the current moment to the McCarthy era because I think there are a lot of differences, but I'm talking about at a level of repression and uh, an intensity of repression. I'd say that this is the worst it has been since then. I was just reading an article the other day, and I know, I'm, I'm not going to put him on the spot, but um, you know, my, uh, my colleague Martin, uh, you know, had been telling me about this, and, and I, I've been looking at it also, but people are being dragged into court and put into prison in, in Germany at the moment uh, for saying even what we would consider moderate things about Palestine. Uh, people are being summoned to uh, police offices right, in, in the UK for discussing Palestine. You know, a well-known um, um, activist, uh, Mohammed Kurt, you know, he was summoned to a, a police station in, in London for a, a speech he gave at a pro-Palestine demonstration in London. And he responded the, the way that one should respond, you know, which, which requires a lot of courage. I'm not saying if you're ever in this situation, you should, but he got on Twitter and he made fun of the police department. Right, you know, and uh, then he showed up at the, 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 the police department, told them to buzz off, and, and went on his way. But point being, you can go through the last 50 years of firings, of criminalizations, etc., etc., and you will not find one single professor in U.S. academe, or Canadian academe for that matter, who has ever been fired specifically for pro-Israel sentiment. It simply doesn't exist. Now, what we're seeing on U.S. campuses, there's this, I, I, don't, want to use, I don't want to use an appropriate language, I, I don't know what to describe him, a professor at Columbia, you guys, have, got, have you all seen this guy? The Shai David guy? Yeah. Yeah, 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 man, this guy, 
again, I, I don't have the right word. I actually need film, so I'm gonna uh, I'm, I'm not gonna do any of the action that's coming to my head. But uh, you know, it's just screaming and screaming and screaming about how uh, you know it's it's unsafe for Jews. The, you know, we can't do anything. We're everywhere we walk. You know, we're and if you you unpack like because this is the whole this is the whole strategy. You know, of, of, of Zionist activism is, is to walk and whine and bitch and cry and moan about um, you know how unsafe they feel and how horrible it is and and, and how overtly anti-Semitic everybody's being. We unpack it. And then, okay, well, what are they talking about? And it always comes down to two things. They just don't want to be what they don't want to be inconvenienced, right, by the presence of people who are opposed to genocide and who make it known. And then any kind of symbol. Of Palestinianness, right? Which I'm seeing a lot of in, in the audience, and you know, God bless you for, for displaying it. You know, the the kafiya, you know, or, or anything, even sometimes a hijab, right? Anything that signals to them Arabness or Palestinianness, right? Is 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 it's considered ipso facto a threat, a threat on its own. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that they're out of their minds, first of all. Okay, fine. Uh, that's that's the obvious conclusion. It tells us something a little bit more. It tells us that. The racism is so ingrained to the point where if Palestinians merely identify themselves that it is enough to create a rupture right, in the audience's sense of safety and sense of place and sense of being. It's enough, in other words, to create a rupture in their belief in the fundamental goodness of the United States, and that in and of itself is going to be considered a tremendous threat. So that's kind of what, what, what the scene looks like now. Some of the conclusions that, that I draw from this survey of, of the state of civil liberties in, in, in the US and the West is that free speech, is an important protection. I think it's a civil liberty that makes societies better, that have it. I think that it, it, it makes intellectual life better. I think that it makes uh, the life of, of a public discourse better and, and more interesting. But free speech is always going to have hypocrisies built into it in terms of how it's understood and in terms of the way that it's actually practiced. Because free speech is the property and the domain of the state. And the state is always going to act in such a way that its own interests are preserved. So the state is always going to be more tolerant of speech right, that suits its interests and less tolerant of, of speech that it considers in some way correct. This is all basic stuff. We all know that the, the, the free speech works this way. It becomes, I think, more interesting and more useful when we figure out how it actually functions and which types of, of speech the state welcomes and which type the state doesn't welcome. Because free speech is, it was created by the state. And we like to think of it as protecting us, the citizens, but really it exists to protect the state. All right, so, you know, and, and, and that accounts for a lot of its incongruity, right? The, the fact that in the end, it's like human resources in a company. You know, disgruntled employees always be going to human resources, and it's like, look, look I, I sympathize, I do, right? I understand you're being mistreated, it's BS, blah, 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 but HR ain't gonna help you. HR exists to protect the company, all right? It doesn't exist to protect the employee, right? And the same thing is true of, of free speech, all right? Uh, in the end, in the end, I'm not saying that it doesn't help people, but in the end, it's deployed by the state to help the state. What we're dealing with, like, because in the discourse, again, this is the discourse of free speech, not free speech itself. In the discourse of free speech, free speech is an unimpeachable ideal. It must always be preserved. But people don't always know right, what they're necessarily trying to preserve, right, or what it is that they're actually arguing. They, they, they want to believe that Speech is this universal, neutral act that is always unfettered by context and by power. But all speech acts occur in a particular context and within a particular disparity of power between speaker and audience and observer. All right? And very often it's the state that serves as observer to these speech interactions.
free speech as the cancel culture warriors understand it simply does not exist, won't exist, can't exist. What they are agitating to preserve is a particular idea of America and a particular idea of the West right? through the language of speech and cancellation. Right? That's what they're actually trying to preserve. And it's this particular vision of America and of the West that puts it into fundamental conflict with their perceptions of the East. All right? And so we are always, those of us here in, in, in this part of the world, or at least tacitly sort of positioned against the modernity represented by the practice of civil liberties in the United States and, and, and Europe. And they don't think about it critically, right? Because it doesn't pay you to think about it critically. You're not going to get published thinking about it critically, right? They can, they can drag people to jail and fire them for their job simply for saying, I'm opposed to genocide. I'm opposed to the slaughter of 20,000 children over three months. I'm opposed to bombing entire towns, entire cities into rubble. I'm opposed to attacking hospitals. Right? I'm opposed to child murder. I am opposed to forced starvation. Well, in what context would any of those statements be considered inappropriate? And yet they are considered inappropriate at the level of state in the West, in Germany, in the US, in Canada, in the UK. So what does that tell you about what free speech means to them? What does that tell you about the ethics that their notion of free speech is tethered to? What does that tell you about how much value they actually place on speaking? All right? So I don't want us to think of free speech as this neutral common good. It is always a good that, uh, that exists within a material politics and that exists within disparities of power. And when it comes to disparities of power between Palestinians and those who are interested in seeing Palestinians survive and be free, right? and then the enemies of Palestine, it's the Palestinian who ends up on the wrong side of that disparity of power. So when free speech comes to you, uh, I would urge this to the students especially, don't just accept it as a given, as a universal, as a neutral good. Think about it instead as something, as an item, as an object, let's say, an intellectual object, a moral object, a political object of contestation. And it's con contested between groups that exist in situations of power. So think about who's the more powerful party, think about who's the less powerful party, and think about the ways in turn in which the less powerful party is systematically right, prohibited from speaking in a way that represents its actual beliefs. Okay, so there's about uh, 14 minutes left. I, I, I think I've talked enough. I'm gonna go ahead and take comments and questions. So. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, do you want me to call? Yeah, I can call on people, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so, so, yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Omar Shadi. I'm in uh, engineering. So, I just had a question. It's kind of fundamental. It's about the title of your, of your talk and the premise of your talk. So, as someone who tries to avoid adopting the, the American stance on history, which is becoming increasingly harder here in Egypt, uh, it's, it's puzzling for me to hear you characterize the repression of Palestinian discourse in the U.S. as the exception to the rule, when it is clear to me, and to many others, I think, that it is the rule, not the exception. Repression of free speech is so imbued in the national narrative, the national fabric of the U.S., that they came up with the notion of manifest destiny to cover up, to justify the ethnic cleansing and massacre of the Native American population of people who already existed there before they were invaded by the Europeans. So, and this is, you know, part of the early U.S. history. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally accepted. So my question to you is, why do you maintain this frankly false assumption that the Palestine speech repression in the U.S. is the exception and not the rule okay. in, in American discourse? Okay. In the Thank, you. Okay. Thank you, Omar. Um, I, 
I, I, I kind of, I, I, I'm tempted to wag my finger at, the, at all the, the wonderful folks at Kassar now, because like I feel like Omar should have given this talk. <laughs> because I, I feel like you, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of arguing with me, but in a sense, I, I feel like you just summarized my argument in two minutes uh, better than I did in like 35 minutes of, of, of rambling. No, I, I agree with you. I, that was, uh, I, and I apologize if, 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 if at any point, I was unclear. I, I agree with your analysis. I agree with the idea that Palestine isn't simply an exception to free speech. That's in a way why I, I wanted to invert the title. You know, so in, in Ratner's Michael Ratner's formulation, and this is no criticism of, of, of Ratner, who's, who's a hero of mine. Um, in Ratner's formulation, free speech is excluding Palestine. All right, it's a thing that exists, but Palestine doesn't get the, the benefit of it. But in my formulation, all right, there's an inherent flaw, a structural flaw, to the notion and the practice of, of free speech that Palestine exposes. All right, that it's not just excluding Palestine, but Palestine is giving the lie to the notion of free speech as it's practiced in the United States. Does that make sense? And so, again, I would urge you to be a little bit dubious about universal notions of free speech because they all come out of, of political situations. And in the United States, there's never been a moment in its history in which free speech was equitably practiced. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's almost impossible to equitably practice free speech in the way people imagine that it exists, and also to, to satisfy the predilections of the ruling class at the same time. Right? And the ruling class is going to win out in the end. And this is one thing that, that, that I, 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 I remember a paper recently where I was talking about this, that, um, you know, we have free speech, right, let's say, in, in, in the U.S., but free speech can't prevent anybody from punishing you. Civil liberties can't prevent anybody from punishing you or arresting you. It might give you some ability to seek compensation after the fact, but it doesn't ever stop the punishment, you know, before the punishment is, is, is delivered, and that's one of the fundamental problems with it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Please, go ahead. Um, but is it, it, how is it even possible to know if one is speaking freely unless the speech is received with a kind of threat from within the context from which it speaks. <clears throat> uh, does that make is that a question that makes sense to you? It, it makes perfect sense, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's probably a sophisticated answer to your comment um, that I'm incapable <laughs> of providing my 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 sense is that because no, I said, sorry, I meant to ask a real question. How can you tell? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't think, I don't think most people do. I guess is what I'm getting at. That uh, I think people think that they're speaking freely by the act of speaking itself, and the way that the act of speaking ends up, you know, reinforcing their participation in this particular myth, but. I would argue that, depending on the nature of the pushback you receive, it's at that point where you understand what the limit of, of free speech is, and not only legally, but, but culturally and morally as well, and that, and that if you are speaking all the time, and nobody in a position of power is angry at you, Nobody in a position of power is contesting what you're saying. Nobody in a position of power is complaining or going to your boss right, and saying, you've got to do something about this guy, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Then you're not participating in free speech at all, right? That, that uh, what you're participating in is a kind of moral stenography for the ruling class and for centers of power. So I don't know, like, when you say, like, how can you tell? Say that you, you can't tell anything about the nature of your speech until it has been received and, and reacted to. Right? Then, then that's when you get a sense of, of, of whether you're, you're free or not, or in what conditions that, that, that you're free. Um, 
Go ahead, please, yes. and then I'll get to you from here. Uh, hi, my name is Ali, and I just wanted to say that uh, I totally agree with you 100%, uh, but there is a problem. Like, we can talk about this every day, and we can... And I agree with you that the ruling class is going to win, and there is no freedom of speech. We, we know that, and everyone agrees, and that's why everyone's here. That's why. And I like to consider myself, or I like to, and it's an honor to say this, I think similarly to you. When I see like Western media and everything, I can see, I'm going to say about what right now, I can see why right through the bush. Uh -huh. But what, what everything they say, I can see why right through it. But what are we going to do? Like, what's the point of just talking and, and just saying, like this, we almost know this for a fact. And I just, I took a, I'm taking currently taking the course uh, called the, the Irish training with the, the, the Dina. And actually, what the Dina showed us something called combatants for peace. The combatants for peace. Uh, it's like, what was the name of the Palestinian guy? What was the name of the Palestinian guy? Suleiman Khatib and the other guy that I got from. Just admitted you were paying attention in class. I want to come up with this. Because I wanted, I wanted the, because I said a remark on, 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 on this, the, the Palestinian guy. The Palestinian guy, uh, he got into a fight with two uh, IDF soldiers and he went to jail for 10 years and then after he went out. He came to the to the, the Israelis and the Palestinians came together and they came to the reform, the combatants of peace. Ah. And it's shown all over Western media. Uh -huh. And the cover of the It's democracy now. This is a very alternative media, it's not the mainstream Uh okay. <laughs> so the cover, like the cover of the, the thing was a bound Palestinian man and the IDF soldier holding his gun. And it says combatants for peace. Like both of them came together for to, to, to discuss the issue of Palestine and to try to stop the the, 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 the conflict and everything. And then I said I remember that this guy, I said in Arabic, this guy is uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not in, in I agree with what the Dina she told me, I'm not in a position to argue or to say oh, oh, oh. But she asked for my opinion and I said and I said it. She asked for my opinion. I said this guy is not very much. Yeah, and the fact say Nash is mean, Shandalak uh in Sadi. You, you, you want to change for, for everything to Israeli soldiers. And then when he came out, he said that, oh, let's solve the problem by talking. And uh, he agreed that th this is a war and there are casualties on both sides and everything, which is not true. Which is not true. What, what are we going to do about it? Like, if talking is not going to help and the ruling class is always going to win this argument. And I totally agree with you. And I'm sorry you have to, you have to went through or go through everything that happened. And I'd like to, to say that I really think so many people. I really think so. What are we going to do? Okay. It's, it's, thank you. Uh, what was your name? I'm Ali. It's, 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 it's an honor to, to, for me to think similarly to, to you. And we, we, we are on the same wavelength. But that, that, that question of what are we going to do about it always trips me up because I'm not good at, at offering prescriptions. <laughs> I'm more good at, at kind of examining a discourse and, and uh, sort of figuring out how it works, what its properties are, what its implications and such are. But in this case, I cannot speak to Egyptian terrain because the, the problems of speech and, and repression in, in, in Egypt, I think, are something different and, and maybe more difficult than what, in lots of ways, than what exists in the United States. But in the, let's say in the West, right, in these so-called democracies. I still think, even if you don't, or even if you're skeptical about the notion of, of free speech, all right, it's still, in my mind, and probably based on my experience, it's still important to take up for people who are being repressed and, and being defamed. And you want people to stay into their jobs. You know, this isn't uh, like a revolutionary action. We're not going to overthrow the U.S. government and, and install some, you know, anti-Zionists instead. But what it does is it, it, it functions at a day-to-day -day level for people's individual and sometimes community, communal quality of life. So, what Palestine Legal does, for example, it provides legal representation for for students and, and scholars and other professionals who who are facing defamation campaigns or who have been fired. So it's good. What can we do? We can help people with resources, you know, to, to get lawyers to, to fight these defamation campaigns. We can help people, you know, you know, have enough resources to go into court and try to get paid. 
you know, for, for having been defamed. And some people say that we can, should start counter campaigns, and, and, and I think some people on Twitter are doing that already. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm ambivalent about that. But saying, look at all the hateful things that the pro-Israel side is saying, I try to get them fired. I'm not, I'm not sure that's necessarily a good solution. I, I don't know. I'm, like I said, I'm ambivalent about it. But I think that it's a matter of principle. Right? No matter what society we're in, look at, every society has different discursive standards. Right? It's different what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable, what you can do and what you can't do. Right? And we're all aware of it. In a, a country like, you know, my, my dad is Jordanian. And every time, when I was growing up, or when I was younger, every time I went to Jordan, it was very clear to me what was discussable and not discussable. It, it was made clear to me, right? By everybody. I mean, the whole society makes it clear to you. And so in that sense, it's both more difficult and easier. And you know exactly what the boundaries of, of speech are. And, and, and so in the United States, it's more difficult because you don't know exactly where the boundaries are, right? And, and, and the boundaries are constantly shifting based on me. But it's a matter of principle, wherever you're at, whether you're in Jordan or Egypt or, or, or Iraq or, or Canada or whatever, to support people on principle, all right? Uh, support them on principle because people need the support, first of all, but second of all, it's a strategy. People are more apt to use their voices against the injustice if they feel that there is a community there to stand behind them and help them get through the consequences. In terms of making real material change, like, no, we're not going to liberate Palestine through civil liberties. We're not going to liberate it through free speech. We're not going to change the U.S. government from an imperial war machine through free speech. What, what we've, the fight for free speech is, is important is at the level of the individual in a community and showing people support and making sure that there's support networks for people who are, are, are facing hardship. Because I, I can tell you, the only thing that got me through you know, that very public controversy, you know, that 10 years ago now, was, was the, uh, the, the support that people showed me. And it wasn't just financial support, it was just people, even, like, I, I still remember, I've never, I've died remembering this. this is the one reason that I go ham for Gaza. Uh, you, you students probably maybe recognize the, uh, the, the, the acronym I got from, from my son, ham, H-A-M. Um, one of the reasons is because I remember in 2014, so many messages from people in Gaza. You know, saying thank you so much, you're our brother, you know, we, we appreciate it, we, we, we love it, blah, blah, blah. And, and so, you know, like, so like a, a kind of bond gets created with people, right? And, and then you feel more deeply invested in, 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 in the struggle. So again, whether it's, it's Egypt or somewhere else, you look at the environment, you look at the situation, you look at what's permissible, what's impermissible, and within those strictures, Right? You try to offer support in a way that you can. Somebody gets hauled off to, to, to jail. You, you want to be there to help them raise money for a lawyer. You want to be there to support their family, etc., etc. Does that, does that make sense? I'm sorry. I talked over. It's two. <laughs> it is two o'clock. Yeah. Uh, but thank you all for talking. Right, right on time. And uh, Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you for, for coming today. If you have more events uh, later this semester, please go to the CASAR website to check them out. Have a great day. Thank you for coming.